All right. Welcome and good evening, everyone. Um, you have arrived at the 34th District Democrats pre-meeting program, which happens to be our past our post session wrap up. In a moment, um, our first vice chair, Rachel Glass, will kick us off, uh, kick off the Q and A, which was organized by our healthcare and environmental, sorry, environment, energy, and land use caucuses. I will call the official meeting to order at approximately 7:15, and um, we are. Uh, I'm, I'm missing one of our um, legislators. Um, Joe Fitzgibbon is um, potentially running a little late here. I don't see him yet. So I'm going to ad lib a little bit here and let um, Senator Wynn give you a few words about his campaign. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Carla, for having me, um, Madam Chair, and everybody else in the 34th District as well. You know, we had a very exciting legislative session. Uh, candidly, it was probably the toughest one that we've had so far because of, you know, the pandemic and also the urgent needs that we have in our district as well. But one thing that I will reiterate is how important it is for us to have strong majorities in the legislature. And I'll just highlight, you know, one key reason. We've seen that leak from the Supreme Court as it relates to Roe v. Wade. And we knew, we knew that that was happening. And proactively, what we did in the legislature was add more funding for reproductive rights and reproductive health care in Washington State. I think about $30 million, knowing that we're going to have an increased demand from folks within our border states, specifically in Idaho. Uh, we also put more money uh, towards mental behavioral health to support our students during this pandemic. Uh, we also, you know, put together a very forward-thinking transportation package as well. Uh, one that prioritized climate, one that is a shift from the that we've had in terms of just building more roads. Uh, not all the things that I wanted, but we will have things like free transit for youths. So I say that because this is an election year, uh, and it is important for us to maintain these strong majorities. And we're very fortunate in the 34th district to have strong representation that are progressive, that are active in their leadership. And one of the biggest things that we can do is also fight for other districts also in addition to, to work that's being done here because I think we truly have an opportunity to lead. Um, and, and, you know, candidly, I'm, I'm very nervous. Like, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I think the national climate uh, will have impacts on the down ballots that we have locally as well. I think we clearly see the need for strong leadership of Washington State because we can then be that beacon of light for the rest of the nation. But that requires energy and effort from everybody in this room uh, to get involved in the state involved because the 34th is literally one of the most active LDs in the entire state. Um, that is a reputation that is well deserved and well earned. And I would love to have your support, not just obviously in, in my reelection, uh, but also for others across uh, this state as well. Um, and that's kind of where I'll put it. I mean, if you know, it, it becomes a broken record at a certain point, but there are so many election cycles that are, we have to get out the vote. We had to get out the vote after the previous administration. We had to get out the vote for the last midterms. And with the slim majorities that we see at the federal level, and also candidly, the slim majorities that we'll potentially see at the state, it is just as important now as it was back then to maintain majorities, right? So if you believe in reproductive rights, if you believe in climate change, if you believe supporting uh, those most on the margins. I hope you also can help and support candidates that are fighting for that at the state level. So that is largely my main focus. It's been an honor to serve 34th in the past four years uh, doing this work. And, and one thing that I will say is that it is hard. It is hard to get great leaders in this spot doing it for the right reasons. We have a privilege uh, in the 34th where we have elected leaders in that space. Uh, and I hope to, to grow that as well um, as we progress for the next year. So that's my quick update uh, for this next legislative session. Just wanted to say thank you to everybody who was taking the time uh, on, I think it's Wednesday, it's today Wednesday afternoon uh, to be with us today. It all kind of blurs together at a certain point, right? So, you know, I'm staying active throughout uh, this year on the campaign side, on the official side. Uh, because it is important for us to, to prepare for what's going to happen uh, potentially if if the midterms don't go as well as we would hope. So um, thank you for being here and hopefully uh, we'll be seeing everybody as we get engaged on the campaign trail as well. Awesome. Thank you. So I am still not seeing um, Rep. Fitzgibbon, but I think we're again going to uh, use our uh, flexibility skills and get us started with the, the Q&A. 
Um, Rachel, would you like to kick us off? That would be great. Thanks, Carla. Um, I uh, We do have some questions that uh, were uh, formed for us uh, via the EELU caucus and the healthcare caucus. So we do have some questions uh, that folks would like to ask. So I will just go ahead and get started in no particular order. Uh, this is uh, from folks in the EELU caucus. If funding from the Climate Commitment Act is used for ultra high speed rail, will it have the same impact as using funds for more timely projects that could help reduce our emissions sooner? Yeah, really good question. And, and I think as folks know, um, I serve on the Energy, Environment and Technology Committee. So this is, I also serve on transportation. So it kind of hits both um, those efforts as well. And for those who don't know, the Climate Commitment Act we passed uh, last year uh, largely to cap emissions in Washington state and then also use those funds to alleviate the impacts of climate change here in Washington. And I will say the Climate Commitment Act, I mean, I've had conversations with legislators in California and across the nation, and they're really looking at this as a model because you've taken kind of existing platforms and made it better. So the success of that program is absolutely critical for us to tackle climate change because the world is really watching Washington right now. And those funds are in large part um, how we were able to get through the transportation package this past year. And the question specifically is about high-speed rail. And I know there's a lot of perspectives about that in this particular district itself. But the money that was spent last year for the transportation package that was using CCA funds, you know, four million was for planning purposes. And the rest, the 150 million was actually for matching dollars. So if we hadn't done that, we'd be leaving $150 million on the table because it wasn't just gonna be a grant that they would give us, we'd have to match it. So that's what we did with those funds. And it's largely because we wanted to make sure that we had every opportunity to access transportation uh, right now, especially if we're using federal dollars. And again, those federal dollars wouldn't come to Washington state automatically. We had to make those investments to ensure that they came. And I don't wanna repeat of what happened back in the 1970s where the federal government offered us money to build rail and then we turned it down, right? So uh, for me, it was important to have that study because that, that, that puts us on the map for federal dollars. Uh, it was important for us to allocate that money to, to be able to match those federal dollars. And also Washington state is one of 11 high-speed rail corridors that's being considered by the federal government right now as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we're all in and that it's gonna happen right away, but we did wanna make sure that the option was there should that be the path forward. Thank you. Um, another question here, uh, environmentally related. Will Highway 509 be extended south to connect with I-5 and at what cost to the environment will the, uh, and to nearby communities will the impact be? Is that, is that being proposed? I don't know if I've seen that. That's in the 33rd, so I wasn't paying as close as, as I should have. I know that there is a connect uh, issue down south near Puyallup and Kent, but I don't know if 509 is slated to connect to I-5. I could oh. be wrong though, um, but but I don't think that that was fun in the last transportation package. Um, I think it just, it's just, uh, the question is just, will Highway 509 be extended to oh. the south? So I don't know if that, I don't know if these people know any more than you about that. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Generally speaking, I'm not supportive of expansions of highways. Um, and even the ones that we did have in the budget included multimodal like bus lanes, and they were for corridors that had demonstrated need in those particular areas. So unless there's um, some information that I may not know about, I don't think that I would support an expansion of 509 to connect to I-5. In fact, I'd probably rather invest those money in either rapid lines more multimodal options versus going that route. But again, I, I'm happy to stand corrected if there's something that, that's happening that I may not know about, but I don't think that's on the docket right now. Okay. Just, um, Rachel, one second. Does anyone from the uh, caucus want to chime in on that question, the context of that question? I know. Yes. Uh, uh, Annie's here. Annie, do you have any? Annie or Randy. Uh, is Randy on the call? Yes. Oh, good. Okay, great. Either one. Any one of you who want to jump in? Well, I was I was the one that brought it up. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, this is Kate, and I have a hazy recollection that it was proposed a number of years ago, 
And then this year, I, I noticed, but did not cut it out of the paper or make a written note, that one of our lady representatives commented that it would finally be happening. Hmm. I could have misheard. I can't give you a name, so you know I'll take I'll take it that it's my error. But um, I'm very concerned about it. And it had been there had been a big bugaboo when it had been proposed, and I'm not thrilled with the idea. Anyway, so I apologize for not having specific information. I see Anne has her hands up. Yes, Anne, go ahead. Yeah, um, actually, I worked on planning for that extension, but I've been retired for 18 years or 16 years, so um, things have undoubtedly changed. There was a plan to extend uh, 509 to connect near, I want to say, Military Road, that may be totally wrong, uh, with I-5, and it was supposed to be as a byway for freight traffic. That was one of the reasons it was proposed for extension um, because it fed into the Duwamish. I, um, obviously the, uh, the group has more information that's updated, but it was in the plans uh, within the last 20 years. And um, I would expect that if it was talked about as something that was going to happen, that would be the primary focus. No, thanks for the heads up. I'll take a look out if that becomes a thing. Um, but I don't remember seeing that in the list of projects that we were considering, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't necessarily there. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye out. Thanks for the heads up, Kate. Um, all right, well, let's uh, just to switch things up a bit here, let's uh, take a question from the uh, healthcare caucus. Uh, and the question, so uh, after two years of intensive study, the universal health care work group appointed by the legislature to recommend the best health care choice identified single payer universal health care as option A. This will save our state and its people $2.6 billion in the first B billion with a B in the first year and $5.4 billion after, uh, each year after. What will you do to help single payer universal health care make it through the state legislature and on to the governor's desk for signing? Yeah, I think most folks on this call probably know my position on that and the need for expansions of health care. What's funny is I ran into Congresswoman Jayapal um, at the uh, rally for Roe v. Wade the other day, and we actually brought that up because of reproductive health care and the rights afforded to people or the lack of obviously what's going on right now. Um, and truly it's a travesty that your health care is linked to your employer. Right? Like that makes it uh, very, very difficult. That makes it very, very scary for folks as well for a lot of reasons. And I think uh, this is one that's going to require a strong partnership with our federal government. And I have been proud to support, you know, this legislation and others that's kind of pushing us there, but not as fast as we would like. And largely, you know, it, it, it's, you've heard it before and you hear it again, it's gonna be the cost associated with it. Um, and I think it's worth it because it's an investment in our future, um, but also we need more champions in this space. And that's why I'll kind of bring back why the campaign side is so important. People like Emily Randall, who supported this, people who've been uh, champions of this need to come back because there's no shot at being able to get something like this in Washington state without strong majorities, because I can tell you very clearly that the Republicans uh, would not support something like this by any means. Um, so, you know, I've worked on this policy at the state level. We've tried to advance that cause, even if the, the bill itself cannot get through, we were able to get funding to address the planning around it. Um, and it's gonna require some support from our federal government as well. So that's an advocacy point that hopefully we all can participate in. Thank you, Senator. Um, Rachel, I think uh, Roxanne might have a follow-up. She's got oh, Roxanne. Okay, Roxanne, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to uh, quickly reiterate that that is a um, 
savings of um, uh, 2.4 billion the first year and 5.2 billion, I'm, it's in the billions. Um, that's what the state and the people will save. That's not what it will cost us. However, it's gonna cost us in the beginning to get things started. Uh, so uh, Senator Wynn, I'm wondering if another state-based um, healthcare um, bill uh, comes out, will you be willing to sponsor it again? I know you have in the past and thank you very much for that. If another one comes out, will you sponsor it? And also just a heads up that the whole Washington initiative uh, was birthed uh, this week and uh, signatures are being gathered now, but they're likely going to be companion legislation. And again, Senator Nguyen, thank you for signing up in the past to be a sponsor. Will you in the future? Yeah, and, and that's actually a good point is that Washington is the first state to have a public option um, to try and mitigate some of these things as well. Obviously fighting a system that is decades old, that has his history in you know World War II, um, it's hard to unwind quickly. Uh, but I think, again, that's one of those spaces where Washington can be a leader. And as we're fighting for this transformative change, also, um, we're trying to have some victories along the way to set us up for when it is possible. But yes, happy to sponsor again, uh, happy to, to help support as well. And I think folks know, well, maybe folks don't know, but the healthcare issue is important to me personally because of my family and my father's uh, car accident when I was a young kid and seeing how crippling that was for our family. Uh, I talked to a lot of members of the 34th who had to uh, deal with that and how, um, complicated and, and financially straining it can be as well. So I think it's a travesty that in, in a country like ours, in a state like ours, where we have literally some of the wealthiest people to ever exist in the history of humanity, that people have to worry about things like basic healthcare needs. So completely on board. Thank you. Um, uh, here's another uh, healthcare question. Um, we uh, have been applauding our nurses and other hospital staff uh, in the meantime, the hospital lobby in Olympia has been working with legislators to stop minimum safe staffing standards. Uh, during this session, House Bill 1868 passed the House, but then died in the Senate Committee on Ways and Means. This bill was supported by more than 71,000 healthcare workers in the state and would have set minimum safe staffing standards. Um, so without these nurses are leaving the profession in high numbers. Um, and so the question is, what can you do as a member of the Washington State Legislature to support nurses? Uh, would you be willing to sponsor this legislation? Yeah, and I, I've actually sponsored uh, numerous pieces of legislation as it relates to supporting our healthcare workers, specifically nurses as well. Um, one of the first ones that we helped pass in my, in my initial term or initial year was the meals and rest breaks for our nursing community. And I was a strong supporter of this bill as well. I think one of the biggest things that we do have to address, you know, at the very least is that the legislature is set up to go very slow, which obviously I don't necessarily appreciate, but that's kind of the, the system that's set up. And I think one of the biggest things is to help educate folks in that space, but also to ensure that there are key advocates um, in the right places. And, and you'll notice that it died in ways and means, which is probably the most, I would say moderate committee uh, out of all the committees that we have in Washington state, just because of the, the responsibilities that it has. Um, I think at least for me personally, what I can do to help in that space is, is to, to try to get on that committee in order to be able to be a champion in that room as well. And I think given some of the turnover that that might, you know, be something that we can be able to help with in the future. Um, but in terms of our mental health and behavioral health and just our nurses in general, it has been an incredibly difficult time. And I've met with uh, a number of organizations that represent the nursing community, and it is incredibly tough out there. And I, and I do believe that we need to do a better job supporting them. And that's why I supported that piece of legislation that you talked about and I supported other ones in the past. Um, but happy to, to keep uh, on with that fight. And I think that there is a path forward uh, in the future as well. I think also, I will say that there's been a lot of, I don't know, it's hard to say, none of my house members are here, so they can't really defend themselves. Um, the legislative process is very tricky, especially when it's a virtual session. 
So when things are uh, difficult or complex, there are certain uh, things that need to happen before it gets to the legislature to ensure that there's a path forward. So what I will say is I'll commit to working in the interim to figure out a solution. There's a path in the Senate to make sure that that passes as well. Thank you, Senator. I'm gonna go ahead and take a question from our audience tonight. Um, uh, why has the uh, right to repair not passed this session? Uh, what will it take to pass that? Did it pass the House? I know that there was a bill last year. So first off, I'm a co-sponsor of the bill, uh, the version that Senator Hasegawa put out, and also the version that Representative Slatter also put out as well. And there was a version of that bill that I thought was making its way through, but never made it out of our committee. Um, I don't know if we even got a hearing out of our committee, but largely focused on consumer electronics. Uh, I, I think that that is a huge need. I think um, this may sound weird, but it's more of a, a climate change environment impact uh, situation that I care about on that bill more than anything. Um, obviously, you know, there's a lot of natural and, and rare minerals that go into the manufacturing of those devices and they should be um, prolonged in terms of their your useful life. So what's interesting is that even though that bill didn't pass, I think the threat of that passing the Washington State, Apple has set up a program for third party providers to actually fix and upgrade some of these things as well. Uh, what's funny is that I think I heard Microsoft support the legislation last year because I think they also um, were, were keen on how do you address this and you know they they do have tablets and I think computers and laptops that would have been subject to it as well. Um, yeah, I think Patricia, you may have your hand up. Yeah, so I was the one who asked that question. Thank you so much. Um, so it so when I was watching the uh, the all the uh, watching the legislation um, go on, um, what I was told was that the cell phone companies were the ones who were objecting to it. And so that's I, that, that's what I wondered if it was held up in the Senate because of those because of the cell phone companies. Oh, it could be a number of things. I'm sure, right? Like I'm, you know, it could be a number of things. Also, and and I'll, this is not an excuse. This is just kind of how the dynamics of it works. But oftentimes in a short session, especially when in a virtual session, when we're trying to allocate, you know, federal funds and whatnot, um, there will be just be a prioritization. So. You know, not not knocking the bill and not not trying to make any excuses, but I think the main focus for last year was pandemic recovery, allocating the federal dollars, the transportation package, uh, bolstering our basic needs programs, um, some of the healthcare stuff as well. And obviously, as somebody who works on the technology side, I, I care very much about that bill. But one of the other things could be just a matter of prioritization. So if a bill um, is uh, not necessarily a priority, it's kind of a medium one in a short session becomes very tough so i'd be happy to, to chat with you offline or after this to figure out what the path could look like um and i wasn't leading on that one it was senator hasegawa and then also senator uh, representative slatter as well so I, I generally get more involved once it makes it to my committee um and i know that the current chair uh was not keen on it so i'd imagine that's probably a a large factor Okay, we have some more questions coming in from our uh, our participants, our attendees tonight. Um, Senator Wynn, um, regarding the state dollars uh, and in transportation, are they earmarked only for rail or um, for maybe bus, BRT, water taxi, or even some alternatives that folks are talking about, like the gondola? Oh, I think so. It depends is is the answer. And I think, you know, part of the transportation package, at least for the, the rail component of it, that was for a federal match, right? So I think that would have to be earmarked because that's what the federal government would give us. But just to give folks a sense of kind of what we were able to accomplish, right? It was a $16 billion package. And the first one that had more investments in multimodal and decarbonization. And like I said before, even some of the roads um, that were being considered would would have to be would have to accommodate, say, for instance, multimodal and rapid bus lines as well. There's even a provision in there where any youth under the age of 18 would ride free on all transit. So we made transit free for all youths uh, in this proposal. There's even um, bikes. So uh, oftentimes we want to 
ensure that we build a culture and a habit of using multimodal. And one of that is ensuring that our young people will take advantage of the systems that we're going to build. So that's why we had the free fares for youths. That's why we had uh, the funding for bike programs throughout the state. And our focus is to really transform how that looks. Um, specific projects, you'd have to go, I mean, $16 billion. So you have to go into specific details as it relates to particular projects. The, the gondola specific, I don't think that there's anything earmarked for it. I think it's still in the, the study phase. I know that WashDOT um, had put out, was it WashDOT or Sound Transit put out a study as it relates to the gondola. So I don't think that there's any funds attached to it, uh, but I know that there's a concerted effort, at least in the 34th uh, around that as well. Thank you. Um, here's uh, another question from uh, one of our uh, attendees tonight. Um, and this is actually kind of connected to your what you've just been talking about with the multimodal transportation. So in the move ahead Washington package, it talks about expanding multimodal transportation, um, which is uh, to reduce the traffic and pollution that disproportionately impacts communities of color and makes affordable options available. Um, what are these uh, expansions? Like what are the projects that are being talked about? Um, where can we see them listed? And um, then there's a second part of this question. The transportation package directs 35% of Climate Commitment Act funds into programs serving communities of color and low-income communities um, the question is, where can we see what these programs are? I am going to put into the chat the link to the lead committee with the enacted bill. I'll, I'll admit that it's not the easiest um, website to read, but what you're going to see is about $5.4 billion towards decarbonization and multimodal expansions. That's everything from buses to bike lanes and connecting our communities. Um, there's about three billion for public transportation, which includes, you know, fares for 18 and younger. Um, there's even uh, 1.3 billion for active transportation, so being able to connect routes. So right now, one of the hardest parts about utilizing multimodal is that to get to one bus route, you got to go through, you know, all these streets that don't have sidewalks, right? So like helping local jurisdictions be strategic about how they invest that money so that we connect our multimodal services across jurisdictions. Uh, there's even 100, uh, sorry, 836 million uh, to build hybrid electric ferries. Uh, you know, in, in the Washington fleet, the, the, the ferry boats are the largest emitters of carbon pollution. Um, so making sure that those are electric is a big one as well. And there's even $50 million for walking and biking infrastructure, specifically for underinvested communities. So there's a ton of stuff uh, in there. And I think what's funny is that those are just the high level stuff. There's things that we put in there that people are gonna you know, keep seeing over the next few years um, to come just because we really wanted to change the way that we thought about transportation, right? It wasn't just freight and mobility, it was freight mobility, people, and also how do you lower carbon emissions? And for me, the reason why this is such an important package is because I feel like the transportation sector is key in terms of us lowering our carbon emissions, but also it unlocks things like economic opportunity. And it locks things like affordable housing. So ensuring that, say, for instance, we had funding for Burien to allow for transit-oriented development, things like that were all kind of part of that package. So if you look at that list, I mean, I think it's like a thousand pages, so have fun. But um, that can give you a list of everything that's in there. But if you just look up, uh, I think Crosscut did a really good summary of it. The Northwest Progressive Institute did a really good summary of it, summary of it as well. Great. Thank you. Um, here is another uh, EELU caucus question. Um, how is the state planning to use federal infrastructure funds to promote climate resistant, resilience, sorry? Uh, is green infrastructure such as tree planting in flood prone areas and promoting salmon habitat by removing culverts under consideration as potential ways of utilizing federal infrastructure funds? Yeah, we put, uh, I think, $2.4 billion towards fish passage removals and barriers that would impact our salmon. So the answer first off is yes. What's also funny is that it's a Rep. Fitzgibbon's bill, um, but it had to deal with uh, kelp and seaweed. So decarbonization, including, um, you know, uh, in, like embodying the carbon as well. 
So seaweed and kelp are the largest um, sequestration of, or not the largest, they, they, they can help a lot with sequestration of carbon. Uh, and we had a bill around that as well to encourage the development of that. And, and sorry, this is you know, kind of wonky, but like even things like removing invasive species like the purple sea urchin, which eats kelp, which then hurts our ecosystem, which then lowers you know, their carbon reductions as well. So there's a number of things being done in that space. And then also um, Hillary Friends, our, our, the Department of Natural Resources Commissioner, had a whole policy on keeping evergreen green around planting trees, around using our forests, and how do you, in an innovative way, um, uh, ensure that we can keep our uh, trees uh, here but also use that as a mechanism to generate revenue for other additional projects. So essentially offsets are gonna be a thing, right? Like decarbonization, people buying offsets in order to uh, offset their carbon usage. In Washington state, feasibly can use our forest and say, hey, if you want to buy offsets, you can have this forest, never have anything ever be cut down and that can go towards your credits as well. So there's a variety of things that are being done in that space for us to lower our carbon emissions. Some of them very innovative, as well. Um, but yeah, there's a number of, I think, you know, candidly, that's, if I had to pick, you know, one, one policy, they're all my babies and I love them all, but climate change is, is probably the most important one for me uh, for a lot of reasons, because I think it's about our future, but also Washington state has done such a great job, you know, with the clean uh, energy transformation act with the CCA um, with the low carbon fuel standards, you know, things like that, that the world is now watching us. And really, I think the next step is investments in renewable energy and green infrastructure, like we're saying right now. There's even uh, an effort to turn one of the Avesta coal mine plants that's been shut down into renewable hydrogen. So using that as a, a hydrogen facility uh, that would have green infrastructure and they can just plug into the grid that's already set. So I think that's the biggest opportunities that we have in that space. Thank you. Uh, another question from the uh, audience this evening. Um, Many Republicans um, or Republican politicians, let's say, uh, project a kind of, at least in the nation, I'm assuming this is uh, talking about Washington, uh, pro project a public persona of being, uh, <laughs> to pardon the French here, bat poo crazy in emulation of Trump. Um, it, how does that compare with what's going on in the Senate chamber, I'm assuming in Washington state? Um, and what, uh, what, what's the climate like as far as how, how you can work with Republicans? Um, are they, how's their sanity, I guess, is the question. <laughs> I see Rep Fitzgibbon is also here, so we can- uh, Yes, welcome know. Rep Fitzgibbon. I will say, first off, so I'm gonna say two things and why it's important for Democrats to have a majority, right? So last year, if you look at all the bills that we passed, all of the bills that we passed last year, 94% of them were bipartisan, 94%. I agree, I mean, so we, we agree on, on a lot of different things. The things that we don't agree on are obviously, you know, there as well, but that's what happens when you have a strong democratic majority with people who are actually trying to make Washington better. I will also say there were bills that never made it to the floor that would have attacked women and women's rights, that would have um, reversed things that we've done on climate change, that would have harmed our communities as well. So, you know, there are avenues for us to work together, but it's also important for us to have strong democratic majorities because, candidly, the reason why there was work being done was because we had that uh, position to, to be able to have those majorities in the House Senate and the governor's office. So um, I will say it's not as drastic as the national levels, but there are definitely people in Washington state who've gone to those MyPillow conferences, uh, who are post QAnon on their, on their things, um, who are currently running for Senate as well. So if folks wanna get involved, there's a lot of places to get involved. So I'm not saying that that doesn't exist in Washington state. I'm saying that because we have our strong majorities, we can limit that type of uh, shenanigans here. But that's not a guarantee. That's why it's important for us to have strong Democratic majorities. And that's why, you know, Reference Gibbons has done so much on the campaign side uh, to elect uh, strong leaders in the House, because that's how we get stuff done. Yes, and uh, I cannot overstate 
folks, uh, our midterms are coming in November and we it this just means that we have got to be voting. We've got to have our all our friends and neighbors voting uh, democratically, of course, is is the ideal. But uh, getting out to vote uh, and that there's we're hearing so many things about how folks are Democrats are not as excited to vote for this midterm as the Republicans are. And we just must get beyond that, whatever that non-excitement is and get well, voting. Fast, yes, <laughs> we don't have a lot of time. No, uh, time. Yeah, uh, Re uh, welcome Rep Fitzgibbon. I, I, I thought I would just uh, have a, we've just got questions that uh, we've got the audience asking questions. We have some pre-prepared questions. So I'm gonna just ask you a question here uh it's from the uh eelu caucus of the 34th uh they have put that together so uh the question is how can citizen advocates hold their city council accountable for reductions in greenhouse gas emissions what resources can the state provide to help groups push local elected officials in a constructive direction Great question. Thanks, Rachel. And thanks, thanks everybody. I'm sorry to be a few minutes late. Um, but uh, I, uh, this is a great, um, I think, area for us to focus on is how do we make sure how do we hold our local governments accountable for the choices that they need to make at the local level in order to put us on track for the greenhouse gas reductions that we need? Uh, really, the things that local governments have the most control over is land use. And what the, the place that local governments can bring climate solutions to the forefront is in making land use decisions that are uh, supportive of reduction in greenhouse gases and particularly reduction in uh, how much people need to use cars to get around. And by local governments making choices that enable people to live near, the, near where they work or live near transportation choices like biking and walking or riding transit, that is the biggest place that local governments can make a difference in helping reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I don't think there's any rocket science here besides it is important for all of us here, whenever we're talking to our local elected officials to be asking them, what are you doing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? And if they, and, and you know, we are fortunate here in the 34th that we have a lot of great elected leaders in Burien and Seattle who are prioritizing these issues. But I do think that we need to keep asking them, what are you doing and what's on deck? How are we going to continue to make progress in having our land use decisions conform with the greenhouse gas reductions that we know that current and future generations are going to need? So that's that's really at the top of the list. There's a lot of great things that local governments can do to reduce emissions in terms of decarbonizing their fleets. You know, local, all local governments have a lot of vehicles that they use for their local business, you know, making sure that we're, you know, making good choices around, um, you know, collection of organic waste and making sure that all of our, um, you know, constituents have options for how to dispose of organic waste at the curbside level. But really, all of that is pretty secondary to those land use choices. And so that is the thing that I, you know, would start and end every conversation with a local elected official about um, is, is, is how are the land use decisions being made in King County, in the city of Seattle, in the city of Burien, um, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the long run. Uh, Senator Wynn, do you have any uh, uh, input or extra thoughts you would like to add in on that question? No, it's good. Okay. Um, we uh, we just have about, I don't know, three and a half minutes left. So, uh, Carla, do we have time for one more question or should we? Uh, yeah, one more quick question. Okay. Uh, this is for Rep Fitzgibbon. Uh, with landfills nearing their capacities, have you looked into state-of-the-art waste to energy resource recovery plants uh, similar to what they use in Europe? Yeah, interesting question. So the state isn't really who decides what kinds of what kinds of um, waste disposal strategies local governments need to make use of. That really is something that cities and counties decide for themselves. The role of the state is to make sure that whatever waste disposal option local governments are pursuing, whether that's landfills or incinerators or something else, um, is held to a high standard in terms of the environmental impacts of that of that decision. So, for example, this year we passed 
a great bill, um, House Bill 1663, requiring landfills to do a better job of monitoring and capturing methane emissions out of those landfills. Um, so that is a great step forward for one of the, one of the strategies for, for addressing solid waste at the end of its life. Um, incinerators, there's a lot of sort of mixed opinions to be candid about incinerators in terms of the environmental justice impact of the communities that are downwind of those incinerators. Um, there's also a lot of things that suggest that this is a really good solution, that maybe this is a solution that you know has lower, it requires less acreage, for example, than a landfill has lower methane emissions, might have higher CO2 emissions, might have lower methane emissions. Ultimately, what the role of the state is, is to be a backstop and to make sure that whether a local government is choosing to send their solid waste to a landfill or to an incinerator, or ideally to neither of those places, ideally to send the organic waste to a composting facility and the recyclable waste to a recycling facility. And then there's still gonna be some materials after you you know, remove those two waste streams that needs to go somewhere, but ideally we're putting things back into beneficial use before we're sending it to either a landfill or an incinerator. Um, the state's job is to be that backstop and to make sure whatever that, that end destination is of those materials that it's not causing harm to the communities nearby, that it's causing as little as possible harm to our climate, which is was the point of the bill that we passed this year around landfill methane emissions. So um, a lot there's, you know, a lot of folks are interested in incinerators. I will say that there tends to be really strong pushback from the communities that the incinerators would be located in. I think that that's um, something that we need to just keep in mind as we as we talk about sort of what solutions are um, you know are appropriate for for our solid waste struggles. The best thing we can do with solid waste is to use less stuff um, to begin with. But obviously, you know, none of us are perfect. None of us are at that place yet. So we need to just think: what can we reuse? What can we recycle? What can we compost? And if we are going to be throwing things away, you know, what is a way that we can dispose of things at the end of their life that doesn't create harms to the communities that that facility is sited in? Senator Wynn, anything to add? So the biggest thing too is that one of the things we're considering is just our recycling in Washington State. And, and again, kind of the best ways to, to address the landfill capacities is not send stuff to the landfills. Um, I think there's gonna be a concerted effort around that again next year, uh, but that's probably my main focus largely is on the recycling component of it. Thank you. Um, we literally are at time and I do want to respect because we've got a lot of stuff. Carla's got a lot of stuff to talk about with us at uh, the meeting. But gentlemen, Rep Fitzgibbon and Senator Wynn, thank you so much for being with us this evening and answering all of our questions. And um, would you gentlemen like to put your contact information in the chat so that people can, if, if you think of a question that you didn't get to ask, or if you just want to reach out to our elected officials, uh, you they they can contact you that way. So uh, thanks for doing that, and thanks again. Uh, have a great summer, and we will see you soon. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, and I'll say we thanks, will everybody. see you both hopefully at the G July fourteenth uh, fundraiser. Uh, we will tackle you both uh, to get you to show up for that. That'd be great. Um, thank you, Rachel, for moderating. And thank you to Senator Wynn and Rep Fitzgibbon. I'm betting that uh, both of you will see lots of support from our organization in your upcoming elections. Um, and with that, I'll take uh, that as a segue to remind everyone that next month, we will be holding our annual endorsement meeting. If you want to participate in endorsements, you must be a PCO or a member of the organization. So new members must join tonight. This is the last night for anyone who's not already a member. Um, renewing members must join by the night before the June meeting in order to cast a, a valid vote that night. So don't miss that opportunity to weigh in on our endorsements this year. Um, I've actually heard from several members um, recently that they weren't uh, altogether supportive of some of our endorsements last year. And, um, you know, really the only way you can change that is to attend and vote 
and encourage more members to get involved in the 34th and participate in those endorsements. So uh, please do that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording.